Hello, MBA students. This is Professor Thompson. I'm here to do a, a quick makeup session to cover some of the material that you missed on the April 15th course. Um, this is a new format for me, um, but uh, I'll, I'll talk you through conversationally some of the concepts that we want to make sure you have in mind. Um, the session on the 15th, our, our goal was to talk about how um, cognition impacts ethics. In other ways, in other, in other words, the, the shortcuts that our brains take often profoundly shape how we view and interpret ethical situations. So I want to start off um, with one of the classic ethics scenarios that we, we consider a lot when we're, when we're studying ethics. And this has been subject of a lot of research. So I'm going to tell you a story here. And if we were in class together, we would have a a hearty, vibrant discussion. Um, so in place of that, I just I encourage you to react to this story and give an honest response to how you would respond. So here's the idea. Um, you are standing next to a, a train track and there's a trolley on this track. It's a runaway trolley and you see that it's about to run over and kill five people. But if you throw a switch, you can turn the trolley onto a side track where it will kill only one person down the track. The question is, are you going to intervene to throw the switch? If, if you do, you can save five people, but you will um, have decided to kill another person. All of these people are innocent. They just happen to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. So what's your reaction to this case? How likely is it that you would throw that switch in the split second you have to decide um, now let me give you another version of this story. So we're going to we're going to change things a little bit. Now consider yourself as standing next to that platform, and uh, just to make things interesting, let's say that for some reason you are you are tied to a post. You're not able to move yourself, um, but you recognize that there is a possibility of stopping the train with a heavy object. So here's your heavy object. A runaway trolley is about ready to run over and kill five people, but you can shove a man in front of the train, saving the five people, but killing the man. Will you push the man? So you're tied up, but there's a, there's a, a heavy man in front of you, and you can get him into the, onto the track, and it will stop the train. So, honest reflection here. Would you do it? Would you, um, would you push the innocent bystander in order to save the five innocent people who, we be, who, who will be killed if you don't? So come up with your answer to that question. Let me add one more layer. Here's a third scenario that we offer. You have five patients. They're dying from organ failure. But a doctor can save all five if she cuts up a sixth healthy patient, removes his organs, and distributes them to the other five, killing one but saving five. Is it permissible to do this? Can you take a healthy person, cut them open, <laughs> um, uh, destroy them in order to save five other people? Um, so think about what your response would be to that question. My guess is, if you're like most human beings, that you saw these scenarios quite differently. And in fact, if we look at how the general population responds here, uh, when we survey people, um, almost 95% are willing to throw that trolley switch uh, to divert the train to kill one person instead of five. But as soon as we change the scenario to um, involve pushing the innocent man, uh, only 10% are willing to do that. Now, what's significant here is that the math has not changed. You'll notice in both cases, you are individually making a decision to sacrifice one person's life to save five others. Um, the only difference is, do you throw a switch or do you push the man? In both cases, you're intervening. In both cases, you are involved. Um, and yet, if you're like most people, your responses were quite different. Um, what's maybe even a little more scary to me is there are 8% of the population who are willing to do the transplants. So pushing the man is just about the same in people's minds as cutting up um, a, a human being. So what's going on here? How do we account for this difference? If we look at it purely from a mathematical standpoint, this makes no sense at all. If you're willing to sacrifice one person for five people, why should it matter how you do it? In any case, you are the agent 
acting upon uh, another person's destiny. Well, um, I, I would love to have a discussion about why you think that is. Hopefully you're, you're giving that some thought at, at, at this moment. Um, let me suggest to you that one of the reasons for the difference is the, the directness of your involvement. As you read in the Bazerman and Ten Brunzel article, which hopefully you've read by now, um, our cognitive shortcuts include uh, a tendency to um, assign more weight to issues when we are directly involved. So if I'm actually pushing the man, if I can feel his, his um, heft, if I can feel his weight as I push him, then I will hold myself more morally responsible than if I simply threw a switch that had some indirect impact. Um, so there's some important things going on here about human nature and ethics. We become less perceptive to the emotional component of ethical dilemmas when our influence is indirect or when the impacted parties are faceless, when they're distant from us. If you imagine the, f the, the one person down the track that you're diverting the train to, you probably don't have a good view of them. You may not ever have to see them close up. So what does this imply in our organizational lives? Well, as managers, a lot of the decisions you make are going to impact faceless people, people you will never meet. Um, a lot of your decisions seem very indirect, distal, from the effects of those decisions. And again, the article you read talks about the Ford Pinto. Um, if you come face to face with the victim of the Ford Pinto fire or the victim's families, um, you have a different response, just as Danny Joya did, um, than if you're just looking at a spreadsheet, looking at numbers. So here's one of the cognitive limitations that we have um, as human beings um, when, when we are removed from a situation, we feel less emotion about it, and we are less likely to perceive that there's an ethical dilemma to begin with. Um, uh, there's this, this model that's, uh, that's a very common way of looking at how people cognitively approach ethics. It's very simple. The idea is, first of all, something triggers your moral awareness, you know, your, your little ethics siren goes off in your head, or you feel a qualm in your stomach. Um, the next step is that you make a judgment. You engage in some sort of analysis and you decide what the right thing is to do and then you act upon that judgment. So it's a very rational, straightforward model. Well, recent scholarship has really pointed out that this operates in a black box. Yes, it's true that human beings do go through this process, but, but this process doesn't act independently. There are a lot of other things going on in human ethics that are different than rational ethics. Um, our emotions affect how we view moral situations. We've already talked about personality differences that can shape us. We've got cognitive errors. We're going to be talking more about group pressure next week and how it impacts the way we view ethics um, and, and dilemmas. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the ability to rationalize and how our situation, our environment impacts us. It turns out that there are just a, a tremendous, there's a lot of noise in the process of coming up with an ethical judgment. Let me share with you another story that kind of brings a fine point to this. Um, how might your mood affect the decisions you make, the ethical decisions you make. Um, if we go back several decades, there's a classic study that was actually conducted in an airport. And back in those days, there was something called a payphone. Maybe a couple of you remember what that, that is. That in a payphone, you'd put in a quarter and make your call. And then if you were smart, you would reach in the coin return to see if anyone had forgotten their change or to see if, uh, you know, if there was some money left over. It was just kind of a, a habit that people got into. So the scholars for this study um, staged a scenario, I believe it was an airport, where they're, they're standing next to a, uh, a payphone, um, and someone comes up to, to use the phone. Um, now, the, as the person was using the phone, um, a, 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 an actor would walk by, carrying a, a, a bag with, with books and things in it, and timed it just so as the call ended, they would walk by and spill everything on the floor. And the, the researchers wanted to see if people would stop and help 
would stop and, and pick up the books. Um, and um, they also um, uh, manipulated whether or not the person found money in the coin exchange. So here are the results if the individual in the study found a dime. So you got 16 subjects here, 14 stooped down to help, two did not help after finding the dime. What happened if there is no dime in the coin exchange? Um, it's pretty shocking. Um, it, it's a result that has gotten a lot of people's attention. Very few people were willing to help when they hadn't found the dime. So there's something that happens to us when we have even very small amounts of luck. Our, our immediate mood has a profound impact on how willing we are to help another person. Um, if you encounter someone who needs help, you're much more likely to help out if you're having a good day or if something good has just happened to you. So we know that our mood affects our ethical decision making. It's not as rational as we might expect. Um, how about our external environment? Um, there's a classic study called the Good Samaritan Study. Again, uh, done many years ago, but it's talked about a lot. And you, you may have heard this study. It takes place in, um, it, was, it was actually conducted in a, a theological school, a seminary. And um, the subjects of this study were all students preparing to be priests. And they were told that they needed to take an exam on the Good Samaritan parable, um, which many of you may know involved helping someone in need. Um, the trick was that as the students arrived to take this exam, they were told, I'm sorry, you're in the wrong place. You need to go to the other side of campus. And they had arranged it so that the most direct route to get to this other building passed through a fairly narrow corridor between two buildings. And in this corridor, they placed, yet again, an actor, um, someone in distress. I believe there were a couple of different situations. One was a, a woman who was crying. One was um, a man who looked ill and kind of passed out along the, along the corridor there. So you really had to sort of step over or step around this person to make your way to the exam. And um, the, the, the headline that comes out of this story is, wow, a whole bunch of these priests on their way to take a Good Samaritan test would step right over that, that, uh, pers that, that needy person um, to get to their exam. Well, the story isn't quite that simple because the researchers um, were interested in how um, external pressure impacted uh, these these men and they they were all men, um, and so for some of the men, they said, um, you know, you need to get across campus. Um, you should head directly there, but you got plenty of time. Now in that case, almost two thirds of the of the students did stop to render help. But what happens if we change the degree of hurry? Um, when the researchers said, uh, boy, you're you're going to need to move pretty quickly to get there in time, otherwise you'll be late. Um, helping dropped to 45%. Um, and then there was another condition where they said, look, you've got a hightail up there or you're not going to make it. You better run. And when incentivized to hurry, um, the number of people willing to help in the Good Samaritan study dropped 10%. So what do we take away from this? Well, we just don't do very well when we're feeling rushed with um, ethical decision making or with noticing um, human needs around us. We're highly, highly sensitized to pressures and it changes how we exercise our values. Now there's just a whole bunch of studies on this that are really fascinating and I, I, I won't take time to talk to you about all of them. But some of my favorites are done by uh, colleagues of mine who have found that people are less likely to cheat if they have just washed their hands. People are more likely to tell the truth if they're in a clean room. <laughs> Ironically, people are more honest when they can smell baking bread or citrus scents. So very minute environmental um, factors change how we respond ethically. So uh, I think one takeaway here is it's important that we lead order orderly lives if we want to be ethical people. If we are living in a state of chaos and pressure, we probably won't be as magnanimous or as virtue-oriented as we otherwise would be. Um, at this point, I would like to like you to pause, and um, you'll see in the dis in the uh, 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 the the discussion section on YouTube. Um, below this video, if you pause it, you'll see a link. And I'd like you to watch a TED Talk by Dan Ariely. 
Uh, he's a brilliant social scientist, and he gives a really fascinating talk about uh, the nature of cheating. So please pause now, and then when you're done watching that video, come back and continue with me. Okay, hopefully you're back now. So as we take into account Dan Ariel's video, um, the things we've discussed, and the things you've read this time in um, the Badaraco book, he talks about contests of interpretations, that in reality the, the pragmatics of ethics are that we are in the process of trying to cognitively impact people. We have to make a case for ethics because it doesn't speak for itself. So in this whole environment where cognition plays such a role, there's a few things we need to ask ourselves. How much of my judgment is rooted in emotion? What does that emotion tell me? If I was an objective observer, if I wasn't caught up in this situation, if I step out of it, would I adopt a different um, behavior? Um, what if I were in a better mood? Is my mood impacting my response? Am I feeling too rushed to make a good judgment? Are social pressures impinging upon me? Am I being realistic about my potential for error? Now I want to close this um, cognition discussion. The last topic is a framework that I've found really valuable for managers to understand, particularly as they try to create um, ethical environments. Some of you who have, are campers or wilderness folks might know uh, the fire triangle. And this is a framework that says, if you want fire, you need three things. You need heat, you need fuel, and you need oxygen. In fact, if you have these three things, you will have fire. It's inevitable. Well, um, scholars of, of corporate fraud have come up with a similar triangle, and they're arguing and show through their research that when there is pressure on an individual, when there is opportunity for fraud, and when the person engages in rationalization, um, you will have fraud. It's not a matter of maybe. If there's pressure and opportunity and rationalization, rationalization being the key cognitive component, um, you should expect to see fraud in your organization. One of the, the, the all-time great fraud perpetrators, um, I, I had a chance to hear, hear him speak a few different times. He spent, he was a very successful corporate leader and, and ended up in prison after being a fugitive on the run in South America. Incredible story. But he talks about his process of becoming a fraud perpetrator. And he said, it's all about suds. And suds to him means seemingly unimportant decisions. He did not launch into a massive fraud on day one. Um, he would uh, cut a corner here, cut a corner there. Uh, you read in the the, uh, the Bazerman article about the boiling frog effect, and we see plenty of evidence that this goes on in organizations as well. You probably won't get into trouble. Well, let me rephrase that. You're probably not going to end up in jail because of a spur-of-the-moment decision. Rather, it will be an accumulation of a lot of little decisions that leads you to fraud. Now, I'm saying you. I don't expect any of you to be in jail. I, I think you'll all be fine. But if we believe in statistics, um, then probably at least one of your class is going to become guilty of fraud and maybe end up behind bars. I hope you buck the trend. I have great confidence in you. Um, as we study fraud perpetrators and what they look like, I'll just quickly go through these things. Fraud perpetrators don't look like your typical criminal. They look a lot more like you and the people that you will employ. So just because you are managing people who seem um, conservative or, um, or uh, professional, polished, um, straight arrow, uh, you cannot assume that they're not capable of fraud because it's it, the potential is in all of us. What we also know about fraud perpetrators are some psychological traits. They tend to be people of high self-esteem, high um, optimism. They tend to be achievement-oriented, have a strong motivation. They tend to experience family harmony. So again, fraud perpetrators are not going, you're not going to be able to smell them out at first glance. What we have to be concerned about as leaders is the fraud triangle. First of all, are 
are our employees under severe financial pressure? What does that come from? Well, perhaps employees who live beyond their means, who are experiencing high debt, poor credit, um, who've gone through personal financial losses. Um, if, if you recognize in your employee these sort of pressures, um, then it requires vigilance on your part. Um, and as a personal note, um, this is one very important reason for you to live within your means. You don't want to put yourself in a position where it's easy to rationalize uh, stealing from your company. Now, the second factor is opportunity, and this is perhaps where managers have the most um, uh, range for influence. Um, even though we'd like to live in a world where there are no controls, we're not in a police state, uh, the fact is that when people have an opportunity to easily uh, perpetu or perpetrate a fraud, they're much more likely to do it. So some of the things that we need to be concerned about as, lead as leaders is putting reasonable controls in place, making sure that there are ways we can judge the quality of people's performance rather than just the quantity. Another huge one is the message that you send by, uh, w with what happens with people who do break the rules. If you do not discipline, you are going to invite a culture of, uh, of, of cheating and shortcutting. Um, I actually saw this in my organization's quick story um, during my corporate time. Um, I, I was on a, a, rota a training rotation, as probably many of you are, um, being developed and, and uh, had an opportunity to interact with a bunch of different executives who would kind of come and give us their orientation. Uh, the real estate executive for our firm was someone who immediately struck me as kind of an unsavory character. He told a story about when he used to work for McDonald's, and he was building, uh, he was acquiring properties um, for McDonald's in um, southern Germany, I believe. Now there is uh, there are laws in Europe that if you excavate for construction and you discover uh, ruins. Um, that you need to stop construction at that point and bring in the anthropologist to see what you're disturbing. Um, and they did. They're, they're getting ready to dig for a McDonald's, and they, they ran into what was clearly some, some columns, some, some, uh, some leftovers from the, the Roman Empire, um, you know, a, a, a historical treasure. So they contacted this individual, this executive, and said, hey, we've, we've run into this. He proudly told all of us uh, uh, new employees who were coming to the organization, he said, what do you think I did? I told him to keep digging because our business is more important. Um, and it was just, it was so jarring to be in an environment where um, a leader would inculcate the idea of performance at all costs, even breaking the law and disrespecting something of value. It's important also that you figure out how to have an audit trail. So let's go last, very last concept, rationalization. Um, is this an alien concept to you? Well, let me ask you this question. How fast do you drive on the freeway? Um, does it depend on what you're driving? So if you're in this car and you're like most people, you probably go faster than you ought to. And I will confess I am one of these people. Well, how do we rationalize that? We're otherwise law-abiding citizens. We probably believe that rules are important. And yet we're very adept at feeling okay about breaking this law on a consistent basis. We might do it by saying, well, everyone drives over 65. I have to go with the flow of the traffic. You know, this is how my car was built. Um, going faster is safer. Um, if it, it's all right to get one or two speeding tickets, it's not going to be a big deal. Um, or you might just say, hey, I'm late, so the rules don't apply to me. We're really good, really good, very adept at telling stories that make us feel better about the things we want to do. How do fraud perpetrators rationalize fraud? Well, this is an empirical question. Um, scholars have studied the stories that people tell after fraud. Here's what fraud perpetrators say. I was going to fix the books as soon as we got through this hard stretch. 
Others would say, it was a loan. I was borrowing this money from my company. And I was going to pay it back. Others feel entitled. The organization owes this to me. Um, it's for a higher cause. You know, Jean Valjean getting, uh, stealing a loaf of bread for his starving relatives. Um, there's not really any victims. And um, lastly, I simply deserve more. So um, as we close this off, I guess one of the takeaways I want to point out is uh, I, I think it's really important that we immerse ourselves in a recognition of our own capacity for rationalization. We are all hypocrites, um, myself included. We, um, we espouse values and then we talk ourselves out of them and rationalize. Um, I'm not saying that to make anyone feel bad or to feel like a failure, but rather to say, this is the human condition. If we, if we want to change the world, if we want to make our organizations a better place, we have to recognize and deal with the fact that um, we do not always live up to our ideals. Only through recognizing our capacity for rationalize do I think we can really address it and, and overcome it. I'm going to close this off now. I hope you're all well. Look forward to seeing you on Wednesday. Take care.